This week I talked to Professor Jay Garfield about Buddhism and the philosopher Nagarjuna. So we're going to be talking about this um, Buddhist philosopher and he's a, a figure of, um, I take it, towering importance in his area, but not widely known in Western philosophical circles, really. So he's this guy called Nagarjuna, um, and he is an Indian, um, is that right, he's an Indian uh, Buddhist yeah, scholars argue about his dates within about a century, either way. Mm -hmm. But the biggest consensus is late second century, and he lived in South India, probably in the lower Krishna River Valley in what's today Andhra Pradesh. Mm -hmm. um, which was then a kind of hotbed of um, monastic Buddhism and a place with a lot of um, academic monastic uh, Buddhist institutions. But he's coming in to the Buddhist scene fairly late in the Buddhist game, though early in the Mahayana story. Buddhism begins in about the 5th or 6th century before the Common Era. And it begins with the teachings of a guy named Siddhartha Gautama. People sometimes think the word Buddha is his name. It's not. It's an epithet. There's a whole lot of epithets for Siddhartha Gautama. But um, what Buddha means, it's the past participle of the term Bodhi. And Bodhi means to wake up. It's a perfectly ordinary term. It's what you do when the alarm clock goes off in the morning. And so Buddha just means the guy who woke up. Right. So it's an epithet, not a name. Um, his name is Siddhartha. And he was um, he spent most of his life as a wandering mendicant teacher. Uh, he was apparently a scion of a royal family in a very small kingdom in what's now southern Nepal called Kapilavatu, who left home to join the kind of uh, what I think of as the hippie movement of his time <laughs> of wandering uh, folks trying to figure out the, the meaning of life. Um, I kind of like Buddhist philosophy because it recapitulates my life a little bit in that way. Nice. But um, anyway, um, he taught a particular set of doctrines, though not in a very systematic way. He taught over about 35 years. And the uh, we can sort of get Buddhism started with his first teaching after his awakening experience in a small town called Sarna, outside of Varanasi. And that talk is summarized in a sutta, a discourse of the Buddha, called the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta, which means the treatise turning the wheel of doctrine. And in that teaching, he um, elucidated what have come to be called the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, sometimes thought of as the Four Ennobling Truths. But Anyway, the four principal doctrines that all Buddhist schools share and that really set the philosophical agenda for Buddhism. The first of those is the very broad claim that all of existence is characterized by suffering. The Sanskrit term is dukkha, the Pali term dukkha. Um, and that just means an unsatisfactoriness, that things aren't going well. Dukkha is part of a polar pair. The other one is sukha. Sukha means really going well. It means actually very close to what we mean in Greek by eudaimonia, mm -hmm. um, happiness or a general sense of well-being. And dukkha means the opposite of that, a sense that things are just plain wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so the first double truth is that um, our existence is characterized by a pervasive sense of suffering. And we could go into detail about the nature of that suffering if you want a bit later, but I'm not sure how much you want to dwell on that now. Well, I think but it's, that sets it's, the, connected to, yeah. um, it's connected to desire, as I understand it, right? It's got something to do with yes. recognizing that um, you have attachments to things which are fleeting, and there's some kind of, something wrong with that attitude. Is that right? Precisely, the second noble truth is the truth of the cause of suffering. So the first one is the reality of suffering and its pervasiveness, which sets the agenda, because Siddhartha's idea was that le leading a life that is almost entirely characterized by dukkha is a bad thing, mm -hmm. and it would be really great to get out of that and to end suffering. And so Buddhism as a whole is a program, philosophical, religious, moral program for the extirpation of suffering. The second truth is the truth of the origin of the cause of suffering. And on Siddhartha's view, that's a kind of triune root of suffering. The proximal causes of suffering are attachment and aversion. 
um, in particular, attachment to things that we don't have and that we want, or that we want and we're bound to lose, mm -hmm. um, or aversion to the situation that we're in. I mean, the leading idea here is that a headache isn't suffering unless you don't want it. Um, and if you don't want it, you ought to do something to get rid of it. Not having a Mercedes Benz isn't suffering unless you want one. That's kind of yeah. the root of the James Joplin song about this, right? Um, so the, the idea is that attraction and aversion are what turn ordinary circumstances into circumstances of dukkha. And Siddhartha argued that attachment and aversion in this sense are themselves conditioned by a very complicated term, I like to translate it as primal confusion. That is a confusion about the nature of reality. Um, the view that certain things really are so good that if we had them, we'd be really happy. Or certain things are really so bad that if they would just go away, we'd be just fine. Mm. Um, that the th things that make us happy will continue to make us happy forever and we can hold on to them and, and so on and so forth. So I am going to go back a little bit to the nature of suffering because it actually makes it a little bit clearer how suffering is related on this account okay. to primal confusion and attraction and aversion. Siddhartha distinguished three levels of suffering. Um, and the first of those is very helpfully called the suffering of suffering. That just means ordinary slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. It's headaches, it's traffic jams, it's politicians, um, it's taking the trash out, it's that it's too cold today or too hot yesterday, or in minds of unease. Um, and there's a lot of that in the world. And a kind of nice insight there that, in fact, that's not pervasive. Um, Everybody experiences something like that every day of their lives. Mm. Um, you wake up and you haven't had your coffee yet and you feel lousy, that's dukkha. Um, the day is getting on, you're really tired, but you still have work to do, that's dukkha. Um, you stub your toe, that's dukkha. On the other hand, you know, you might think, actually, my life has been pretty good today, dukkha here. And then you ask yourself the following question. Am I really not aware of what's going on in Syria or Somalia? or the Sinai? Um, do I not know what's happening in Rakhine? Um, if, I don't, if I do know, um, then there's one of two possibilities. Either that bothers me, and I'm kind of unhappy about that, in which case I'm suffering, or it doesn't bother me, in which case I reflect on who I am, and I recognize that I'm basically an insensitive asshole, <laughs> in which case I'm suffering from not being able to actually reflectively endorse my own after state. Um, and so part of that idea right there at the first level of suffering is even if your life is going well, you're caught on the horns of a dilemma if that makes you happy. Um, you're either suffering because other people aren't or because you can't reflectively endorse your own moral attitudes. Hmm. Second level of suffering. Um, that's already bad, by the way. Yeah. That, that generates the pervasive. Uh, conclusion pretty quick. The second level of suffering that he diagnosed is what's often called the suffering of change or the suffering of impermanence. And there are two dimensions to that. One dimension to that is that everything that we love and everything that's good, including our bodies, um, is constantly changing and generally going downhill. Um, our cars are getting older and wearing out. Um, our parents are getting older and wearing out. Our kids are getting older and getting more annoying. Um, we are getting older and wearing out and suffering the you know aggravations of age and so forth. And so the suffering of change is partly the idea that we really are on a kind of roller coaster towards death. Um, <coughs> The other aspect of the suffering of change, though, is that even things that are good and that we think of as sources of happiness or zipka, if they hang around long enough, they can become a source of suffering. I mean, as I often tell my students, you know, take that, you know, couple of liters of chocolate ice cream out of the freezer, and the first teaspoon full feels really good, and the second teaspoon is pretty good, and the third's okay. But after you're halfway to the bottom, it's starting to feel really disgusting, and that's kind of the suffering of change, that even the stuff that you like, the longer you have it, it becomes boring and, and useless. The yeah. pop song that you can't hear enough of when it first comes out is really annoying and trite. 
two days later. Yeah. Um, and so that's also part of the suffering of change. But the third, the third level of suffering, which is the one that really conditions all of this, is the one called the suffering of pervasive conditioning. And that's the idea that we live our lives at, as a kind of node in a vast nexus of causal patterns. Mm. And we can't control what happens to us from one moment to the next. We don't get to choose our genetics. So we don't know whether we're going to end up with Alzheimer's or not, or some horrible cancer. Uh, we can't control who's been drinking and driving along the road. And so we don't know whether when we cross into a pedestrian crosswalk, some idiot's going to come around the corner and run us down. Um, there's so much that happens to us that's out of our control. We can't, we can't control storm tracks. We vote for one politician, but another one gets in. Um, people who can plunge the world into war are out of our control. And so we lead, lead a life in which while what we would like to be able to do is be masters of our own destiny, we know that we're not. Mm. And that itself is a source of suffering. So when you put those three together, you get the pervasiveness of suffering. So when you get this notion of primal confusion as the root of suffering, primal confusion comes in a lot of different forms. One is, I really could get control of all of this and run my own life. Well, mm. that's bullshit. Um, or the stuff that I want is really going to last forever and keep making me happy. That's bullshit. Um, the idea that I could stand on my own two feet and be independent. That's bullshit, right? So all of the, the primal confusion, it's a, a base of attraction and aversion, is it leads us into courses of action that are predicated upon deep metaphysical and phenomenological confusion about who we are, our unhappiness. So that's the second truth. The third truth at Sarna is that if there's a cause of suffering, there has to be a release from suffering. And that release consists in getting rid of the cause, which means getting rid of attraction and aversion by getting rid of the confusion that underlies them. Now that's actually important to thinking about Buddhism, because it means that the kind of Buddhist diagnosis of the unsatisfactoriness of human existence is that we're really lousy philosophers, <laughs> and that if we could really get a handle on the fundamental nature of reality, and eliminate this primal confusion, then we would cease the pathological attraction and aversion that leads to suffering. And what that means is that a huge part of what Buddhism ends up being about is about this notion of trying to correct um, this pervasive confusion about the nature of reality, which is why philosophical endeavor is such a central and massive part of the Buddhist corpus. Um, and then the fourth truth we're not going to do in detail, that's the Eightfold Noble Path, which is the kind of um, ethical prescription for how to lead your life in such a way as to extirpate this kind of confusion and, um, and uh, attraction and aversion that's consequent upon it. I'll just point out a couple of things about the Eightfold Path that are reasonable, though. One is that part of the Eightfold Path is right view. That is, it's considered a really important thing to get your philosophical house in order um, and understand the nature of reality if you're going to live right. And another one of those is proper meditation. And the, the reason for that, I mean, everybody's image of Buddhism is, you know, somebody meditating under a Bodhi tree. Um, but the, the idea is that it's really easy to get a good philosophical view, but not to internalize it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we all know the stories about ethicists who are complete bastards, um, and so it's possible to really know how, how things are, but never really see the world through that view. And in the Buddhist tradition, what meditation is about is transforming what you know discursively or conceptually into a phenomenologically deep mode of comportment with the world. And so to transform your vision and your perceptual and affective engagement with the world in line with your philosophical views. That's meditation is such an important phenomenon in, in Buddhism. Um, I just wanted to point those couple of things out about the Eightfold Path. So that's, that's what's going on at the beginning of the Buddhist uh, tradition. So then Siddhartha teaches for about 35 years. And the thing is that what he's doing is he's wandering around answering questions as they come to him, or solving problems in his ever-growing band of followers, his monastic order, as those are coming to him. And so there's a whole lot of casuistry happening here. Philosophy or ethics 
um, done by whatever case happens to come up. And so you can think of the collective suttas, um, the discourses of the Buddha, um, as really occasional talks, um, not as the development of a systematic theory. Hmm. The systematic theory begins to get developed in the period subsequent to the death of the Buddha. Can I just pause for a second here before we move on to the to that development? Because I wanted to pick, so your view on how the, the way that you just explained the setup there with the Four Noble Truths very much has getting your philosophical house in order as one of the kind of key constituents to this project. But I've also heard it said about um, about the Buddha that he was not really that into what we would think of as philosophy. And there's this story where, um, and I'm sure you may be able to explain this much better than I can, but something to, he gives an analogy of someone, someone who gets shot with an arrow and who wants to ask all these questions about, well, who shot the arrow and who made the arrow and blah, blah, blah. And if he wants all of those answers, That's right. um, then he'll die before he gets any help. And that's supposed to be some kind of critique of constant questioning of things in philosophy, right? So I took it that he was more of a practical um, thinker than a, than a kind of technical analytic one. So I wonder, wonder what you think about that. Yeah, um... That sutta that, and, that, and that parable are actually quite important, but I think you're drawing the wrong moral from them. Right. Um, the Buddha was not, as I would say, a kind of systematic um, expounder of doctrine, but he was a very systematic thinker. Um, the distinction that's being drawn in that parable, and, and if you actually read the entire sutta, that becomes clear, is not a distinction between um, asking questions and not asking questions or thinking rigorously versus not thinking rigorously. So a, a distinction between thinking about stuff that's useful and thinking about stuff that's useful. <laughs> wow. mm. So the, the context then is that the Buddha is getting bothered by um, a bunch of, say, rival teachers, a bunch of Brahmin teachers who are asking him about the origin of the universe, whether it's finite in time, whether it's infinite in time, <laughs> end of the universe, on all of these abstract metaphysical questions. And the Buddha is saying, actually, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is suffering, the causes of suffering, the release from suffering, and the path to the release from suffering. If you want to ask me questions about what conduces to that, I can answer them. But if you want to ask me these big cosmological questions, that's not what I do. And you're actually wasting your own time asking those questions instead of the questions that are going to actually get you some uh, some release from your problem. So what he's doing there is saying, look, um, there are questions that are important to ask and questions that are not important to ask. This guy who's wondering who made the arrow, who shot the arrow, what cast was he, what direction did he shoot from, all of that, is asking questions that don't conduce to his own recovery. Um, where's a doctor who can extract this thing? That's the right question to ask. So that's occurring in this context of people bothering with these, these very airy, um, abstract metaphysical questions that have nothing whatsoever to do uh, with practical experience. And his view was that good philosophy is philosophy that's devoted to answering human questions. Okay, good. Um, so I put it more, more that way. Good, right. Um, right. But the point that you're making is right, and that is that um, the Buddha was pretty um, narrowly focused on what we might call ethics, very broadly speaking, and the metaphysics that underpins ethical conduct, mm. and not stuff kind of sitting outside of that. Um, that's right. That's right. So he okay. dies, and he hasn't written anything down, and nor has anybody else. This is a highly oral culture at this point. And so the first thing that happens at the first Buddhist council is the canon of the Buddha's teachings has to get settled. And so his principal disciple, Ananda, basically recites as close to verbatim as he can all the stuff that the Buddha said for the last 35 years on these occasions. And that's why whenever you see the suttas, they all begin with the following formula. This is what I heard at one time. The Lord was in this particular place talking to these particular people. Somebody asked him the following question, and here 
is what he said. So it's Ananda really telling you, at this particular day, at this particular place, here's what he said. Right? So you get this, this formalization. It's the first Buddhist council. Basically, what's going on is trying to settle what the canonical discourses of the Buddha are. But again, you want to think of them as case histories. Um, so it's almost medicine or law by reading case books at that point. Mm -hmm. Then what happens over, say, the next hundred years, um, well, about a hundred years later, they get written down, um, and we get the writing of, of the Buddhist uh, the discourses in Pali, which is a kind of um, commercial lingua franca of India at that period. People sometimes think the Buddha taught in Pali. He, he almost certainly did not. Um, he probably taught in a dialect of Magadha or something like that. But they were written down in Pali because that was the most uh, broadly accessible language in India at that point. It was a kind of everybody's second language, yeah. which kind of language in the way that English is in India today. Yeah. Um, and so that then you get a kind of written canon for the first time, and then over the next say three or three to five hundred years, up to you know kind of the dawn of the common era, you get this period of a systematization of the teachings in. In, you know, large textbooks and compendia and philosophical treatises that are called the Abhidhamma, means the higher or supplementary doctrine. But what that really is, is the transformation of these kind of case studies, if you want, into textbooks, into systematic theory. So by the time we get to about the first century before the common era, or so, we've got a pretty good systematization, and indeed a written systematization, of what looks like Buddhist doctrine. So now you're really getting theories that explain metaphysics, epistemology, how it all undergirds ethics and practice, meditation manuals, detailed psychology, decomposition of the personal aggregates into their, into their constituents, and all of that cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, What's happening is that a, a core set of doctrines is being developed and ramified. And these are doctrines that were really clearly articulated by Siddhartha during his teaching career. So if we think about this, a lot of it, um, in fact, probably all of it, is systematization of a set of core doctrines that occupied Siddhartha during his teaching uh, career. And we can kind of put those together in a tiny little Buddhist metaphysical package. And it's a package that will be important to us when we finally get to Nagarjuna. Mm -hmm. um, one of these doctrines is that um, phenomena are selfless. That is, they're without any core or essence. Now, in English, we use the word self generally just to refer to, to human beings. Mm -hmm. But the term that's translated, that we translate as self, which in Sanskrit is Atman, um, has a kind of broader semantic range in Sanskrit. It is a self of a person, but it can be thought of as the core of anything, the thing that makes it the thing that it is, the essence or the substance that has the attributes. And just as it, the self plays that role for individual persons, Atman is broad enough that you can think of the Atman of a tree as well as the Atman of a person. That isn't animist. It just means that we can think of there as being something that makes this tree the tree that it is, um, some kind of a core. So one doctrine that the Buddha taught was selflessness, or the no-self doctrine, anatman, that things don't have any essences or defining characteristics. So the second doctrine is a doctrine, a radical doctrine, of impermanence. And we can think of this as recruiting a very strong version of Leibniz's law, of a kind that Hume would have endorsed in his discussion of identity. And that's the idea that things are identical if and only if they share all attributes. Now, the Garfield is talking now is about 20 minutes older than the Garfield who began this interview. And so he doesn't share all the attributes of the guy who started this interview, and so can't be identical with him. And so what we do here is we replace a metaphysics of permanent substances with changing attributes with a metaphysics of momentary existences that succeed one another in a kind of endless causal sequence. So impermanence is the, is the second of these ideas. The third idea closely associated with these two is the idea of dependent origination, mm. that all, thing, all events occur um, as a consequence of antecedent causes and conditions. All events lead to subsequent causes and conditions. Everything that happens is merely a moment in a vast network of causes and conditions. But they're 
actually three dimensions to the Buddhist idea of interdependence. One of them is this causal dimension that we've just noted. The second is myriological, that wholes depend for their existence on their parts. Parts depend for their existence on the wholes in which they figure. So I depend for my existence on my heart and my liver and my stomach and my feet and all of those things. But my heart depends for its existence as a heart on being embedded in my body as well. So myriological dependence in the Buddhist tradition goes both ways. It's not a kind of well-founded um, drive to, to, the, to the bottom and most fundamental. Um, and the third dimension of dependent origination is what's called dependence on conceptual imputation. And the idea there is that the world doesn't come carved up neatly into objects or objects and properties, um, but rather the individuation that we do that determines what constitutes a whole thing or a part of a thing, what constitutes a stage of a thing versus uh, a thing in its own right. Um, it depends upon our concepts and imputations. So that when I'm looking at my desk, um, is it a single piece of furniture or is it three drawers, a top, a back, and four legs um, arranged in a particular way? Is it billions of you know wood cells? Is it hopeless number of atoms? How we how we aggregate things or draw. Uh, limit to, to them is a matter of conceptual imputation. So the Buddha really taught these three kind of notions. Um, and he taught that they were tightly interrelated, as you can see. And then all of that gets adumbrated in this Abhidharma doctrine, where we start talking about, well, if there's no self, what are the basic processes that constitute a human person? When we look into our minds, what do we find? If perception is it a unified event, but is a relationship between a perceiver and an object? How do we understand that relation? And so on and on and on. And then an adumbration of an epistemology um, that fits into this doctrine. So we get this kind of complicated um, articulation of Buddhist metaphysics. Okay, so I, I had a question here. If um, in that first aspect of the dependent origination, where... Um, everything is causally dependent on some prior antecedent state and is itself an, a, a kind of antecedent state for something else. Um, doesn't mm -hmm. that mean, um, I'm thinking of something like a cosmological argument or something, Doesn't if that was true as a kind of, if, if we, we just state that that's definitely the case, and doesn't that just by definition mean that the, the universe must be endlessly um, infinite in either direction, right? There couldn't be a beginning of time because that would mean that there was a state which kind of didn't have antecedent conditions or gave rise to itself or something. And um, doesn't it mean that we have to kind of yeah. uh, have an endless universe in either direction? Is that is that a consequence you think the Buddha would have accepted here? Well, the, the first um, limb he accepted but wouldn't have been forced to actually if we think it through carefully. That is, he did think that the, the universe was infinite in the past and Buddhists typically talk about beginningless time yeah. uh, for that reason, thinking it just has to keep going on. I mean, but as we know, there are kind of models in which um, every event has a predecessor that don't involve infinity in the past. We could think, for instance, of the universe as having an origin and an open interval. But oh, honestly, okay, that yeah. level of mathematics wasn't available to, to the Buddha. Um, yes, that makes sense. On the other hand, um, yeah, they didn't think that that meant that it had to be infinite in the future. Um, because you could kind of imagine the whole thing kind of running down. Um, but uh, infinite in the past, yes. <laughs> okay, good. I mean, even though he would have probably told me that was one of those questions I shouldn't waste my time thinking about because it's not um, important to alleviating suffering. Exactly. His successors were happy to waste time on it. <laughs> um, because okay. there was just as a generous, rich philosophical and dialectical tradition. Um, so. Anyway, as I was saying, we're trying to work our way towards the Garjana in this big picture. Mm -hmm. So we get this long Abhidharma period of a few hundred years with an enormous articulation of bits of Buddhist doctrine. But one characteristic that's important to see of this period in Buddhist philosophy um, is that it's highly reductionist um, in its metaphysics. And um, it's a reductionism 
that exploits another Buddhist idea we haven't introduced. So now we're going to go back to introduce that idea. Okay. And it's an idea that comes into Buddhism early on, and it will be very important when we hit Nagarjuna. And that's the distinction between the two truths, mm -hmm. or two kinds of reality. Um, to talk about this, we have to talk a little bit bit about the Sanskrit term that we translate as truth or as reality. And in some context in English, it makes more sense to translate it one way and in some the other. But I'm going to try to convince you that that's not because it's ambiguous, <laughs> but because we've done something funny with the semantic range of truth in recent English. Mm -hmm. But we'll get there in a minute. The term is satya, um, which is a kind of um, conjugation of sat, which is, you know, exist to exist or to be or uh, reality. So Sanchez existence or reality being real, being true, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and um, people often say that it's ambiguous between true and real in English. I think that's just wrong. Um, it's not an ambiguity. It represents rather a distinction that we've drawn recently. If you think about the word truth in English and think about it etymologically for a moment, it's cognate with the word trust, um, or the word troth that we now use only in wedding ceremonies. Um, I plight thee my troth, that is, I, I um, agree that I will be true to you, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's where so, betrothed comes from as well, presumably. Yes, it is. It is exactly where it comes from. So true in English means something you can trust. Mm -hmm. So we talk about true coin of the realm as opposed to counterfeit money, okay. or a true friend, or a true Scotsman, um, <laughs> and we still use so we still use the true in that in that sense, right? Yes. Um, now we've come to use the word true mostly for things that bear truth values, sentences, propositions, beliefs, and so forth. But what I want to convince you of that that's a special case of a more general meaning. Those are sentences in which you can trust mm -hmm. beliefs that you can rely on or trust. And that, that sense of truth, in the modern sense of having the truth value true, is actually a special case of a more general meaning, meaning something in which you can tr trust, something that's real. Um, and that's the sense of satya that I want to focus on. So when we talk about the two truths, sometimes we can express those as linguistic. Sometimes we express them in terms of levels of reality. But that's not an ambiguity. That's a kind of pre-forking of the meanings sense of truth. Does that make sense? In a way, yes. Um, it's complicated. But yes, I think I'm going... Uh, so, I mean, like, so in the sense that I will... Um, I'll say something like, I can trust in a proposition or I can trust in the state of affairs that the proposition describes or something. So it's kind of pre-distinguishing pre, um, those two from one another. Is that's, that what we're talking about here? That's right. Okay. So we could look at a, a pond and a mirage and saying that's true water. That's not. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And that, that works in English. Yeah. That works. Um, now, um, when we talk about the two truths um, in Buddhist uh, discourse, one of those truths is always called conventional truth. Now, the word that we're translating conventional, there's a couple of Sanskrit terms, but the most common one is samvrti, which really can mean by agreement or nominal, um, but it can also mean um, concealing which is kind of cute, there's a kind of nice ambiguity that generates a lot of good philosophical puns. So conventional truth is set up by agreement, by ordinary behavior or transaction, by the everyday world, but it conceals the fact that that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Or we could talk about ultimate truth, which is the truth that you get to at the end of analysis, the way things really are independent of conventions, independent of everyday behavior, those two distinctions. Really cool footnote, by the way, um, if you want really strange coincidences. For those of us who like to read Wilfred Sellers' work, mm -hmm. um, in Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man, he glosses the distinction 
between the manifest image and the scientific image as the distinction between conventional and ultimate truth or conventional and ultimate reality. And so has never read any Buddhism. <laughs> but um, that's a really nice. interesting thing to think about. Um, and he's probably not wrong or far off to, to, to draw that distinct, to draw that connection, even if he had had Buddhism in mind. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, coming back to, to where we were, this distinction gets drawn initially in Buddhism as a hermeneutical distinction that's used for um, reconciling apparently contradictory statements in by the Buddha or in Buddhist scriptures. So, for instance, sometimes the Buddha says there's no self, the person is hollow like a plantain tree without any core, without any essence, nothing but a series of evanescent events. And sometimes the Buddha says, well, you know, what you've really got to do is you've got to get control of yourself and stop behaving like this and think about what kind of a person you want to be, right? And so people say, well, my God, here he said there's a self, and here he said there's no self. And the hermeneuticist said, easy to figure that one out. Here he really was talking from an ultimate perspective, mm -hmm. and here he's talking in the everyday perspective, the, just using language as it's conventionally used. And so it was used to sort out texts that needed to kind of be reinterpreted from texts that could be taken literally. Yeah, it's a now, convenient uh, semantic uh, distinction to be able to draw apart any apparent uh, seeming contradiction there. Yeah, it's going to get a twist when we get to Nagarjuna. Yeah. But for now, note that this is kind of hermeneutical device that any tradition with a very large and probably verbally inconsistent corpus has to use. Mm. And we use this, for instance, if we're reading the Critique of Pure Reason, mm. and Kant says something like, well, strictly speaking, you know, noumena aren't even entities. Now let's look at the ground of the distinction of all entities into phenomena and noumena. <laughs> and we say, okay, the first time he was really speaking strict to sensu, the second time he was just speaking kind of loosely, right? Mm -hmm. We do that kind of thing all the time. Everybody with any large and complicated corpus has to have some hermeneutical device for doing that. Yeah. But that's kind of how it how it gets going um, historically in the Buddhist canon. Then, in the Abhidharma period, it gets its kind of first ramification. Because now, in this kind of reductionist mood, we might say conventionally, there are people and human beings and tables and so forth, but ultimately, there are only momentary evanescent property instantiations at infinitesimal points mm -hmm. that are all causally interacting. So now ultimate truth gets re, re, um, re, reinterpreted as truth as or reality as it is at the end of final metaphysical analysis. And conventional truth is the world as it appears to ordinary untutored consciousness, the way that we talk in ordinary language. So this doctrine of the two truths gets adumbrated during the... Um, during the Abhidharma period, and it gets adumbrated very, very much in the way. So what is ultimately real is what's substantially real. Um, it's the fundamental level of analysis out of which everything that's apparent is built, and everything that's composite is really illusory. It's not what's really real. It just appears to be really real to people who really can't see reality as it is. Now, move up about 500 years from the time of the death of the Buddha. Now we're somewhere around the first century before the common era, the first century of the common era, right about that period. Um, there's a transformation or an, um, an evolution that's going on in the Buddhist world. And it's the rise of a new movement in Buddhism that gets called the Mahayana, or greater vehicle. Maha just means big. And yana just means vehicle, so it means greater vehicle. Corresponding to the Mahayana, unfortunately, is a pejorative term that Mahayana practitioners use for everybody else, called the Hinayana, which literally means inferior vehicle. <laughs> and it's a term we try not to use. So nowadays people prefer Shravakayana, the disciple's vehicle, or something like that. Okay, so but, um, anyway. I'd heard yeah. that there was some distinction here when Mahayana comes onto the stage, that it's got something to do, I mean, m maybe this is another, something you can clear up, but 
um, I'd heard it was something along this line, where what well, the Buddha's teaching um, is kind of individualistic, right? So it's about um, working out this um, predicament that you're faced as an individual um, and overcoming that as much as you can so that um, mm -hmm. you as an individual can enter into this state of nirvana, whatever that might be, whether that's just kind of, you know, f fading out of the world of suffering completely, or some something along those lines anyway. Whereas when Mahayana comes along, the reason it's called the great vehicle, the big vehicle, is something to do with trying to include everybody else into that process as well. So there's something about sticking around in this uh, world um, and not popping off into nirvana once you've reached the stage where you can, but sticking around and trying to help other people to um, arrive at that state as well. Is, is that got something to do with this distinction? Or is, is that a simplification? No, it does have a great deal to do with it. Um, uh, there are really two sides to the distinction between Mahayana and pre-Mahayana Buddhism. And the one that's really definitive is the moral ideal. And so we do have the transformation or the replacement of an earlier moral ideal with a new moral ideal. Mm. And to understand that, um, it's again worth going back into a little bit of <coughs> pre-Mahayana Buddhist ethical theory. When we think about the, um, the four most um, important ethical traits that the, um, the Buddha and his followers advocate cultivating, um, they're called um, technically the Brahma Viharas, or we can think of them as the divine states, uh, the or cardinal virtues. Mm -hmm. There are four that rough, have roughly equal status um, in the Pre-Mahayana tradition. One of those is metta, or beneficence, it's meant to be beneficence towards everybody. Um, a second of those is karuna, which is often mistranslated as compassion. Whenever you hear people talking about compassion in Buddhism, they're mistranslating the word karuna, which really means care or commitment to act for the welfare of others and to relieve other suffering. Um, the third of is mudita, which means um, um, sympathetic joy, that is, it's a a happiness at the good fortune or the moral achievements of others. It's very nice, like the, the obverse of Schadenfreude. <laughs> um, and the fourth one is Upeksha, which means a lack of egocentricity, um, an even-handedness towards all people, not seeing some as my friends or as closer to me, others as more distant, a kind of destabilization of yeah. the ego as the center. Mm -hmm. So these all have, a, have roughly equal status in uh, pre-Mahayana Buddhism. But um, with the Mahayana, the notion of karuna or care just moves to center stage and becomes the principal uh, virtue. And with it, the ideal of the bodhisattva. So before this, the moral ideal is the ideal of the arhat, which as you said, is somebody who's managed to achieve a cessation of suffering, liberation from suffering called nirvana. Nirvana just means a cessation of fire. Literally, the term nirvana is metaphorical, and it means blowing out a flame. It's what you do to a candle. And there's a whole set of fire metaphors in Buddhism. Mm. So when we think about the constituents of the person, the constituents, we call the aggregates or piles or heaps um, of characteristics and properties and events. But the actual meaning of the word skanda, the old meaning, is a funeral pyre. Right? It's a heap of wood that you're about to light to burn a corpse. And so the metaphor is that we lead, lead our lives constantly on fire, constantly kind of burning up, and, um, and, and Nirvana is the cooling of that fire. So the, um, the moral ideal um, in the pre-Mahayana tradition, what you're trying to do is cool that fire and get, get rid of your suffering. But um, with the rise of the Mahayana, that gets replaced with the ideal of the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva is, is somebody who is resolved not simply to attain nirvana for him or herself, but instead to achieve full awakening, to achieve Buddhahood, in order to be of maximal benefit to all sentient beings out of a sense of great care for others. So the idea here is that one doesn't only want to eliminate one's own suffering, but the suffering of all sentient beings. Mm. But that requires enormous personal cultivation and moral achievement. So that's the first aspect of the rise of the Mahayana, was this transformation. This is also, by the way, a transformation of Buddhism from an almost entirely monastic 
um, practice into a lay practice. And there's a whole lot of nice literature about how this coincides with the establishment of the very large monastic institutions and the recruitment of large lay populations into supporting them and the need to sort of have a religious or, or philosophical role for lay people in this whole affair in order to generate the kind of support you need to get these massive institutions up and running. Um, but that, that's, that's a whole long issue in the history and sociology of the rise of the Mahayana, which is its own um, industry in, in, in academia. But anyway, so that's, that's a piece of it. The second piece of it um, is a um, refiguring of some of the fundamental metaphysical ideas in Buddhism, um, and in particular, the centering of the idea of the emptiness of essence, what we initially saw as anatman, um, or lack of self, and a universalization of that idea, along with the rejection of the reductionist metaphysics for a kind of very radical metaphysics of total um, interdependence and non-well-foundedness, ontological non-well-foundedness. Um, so when a movement's getting started like this, um, in Buddhism, what you need is a sutta or a sutra foundation. Sutta, as we saw earlier, referred in Pali to the discourses of the Buddha the stuff actually spoken by the Buddha. And that's where everything gets its authority, right? So what you've got here is a classic scholastic tradition where you've got fundamental texts that have their authority in virtue of who taught them or who spoke them. Um, think of the texts of Aristotle, the philosopher, right? Um, and then you've got layers of commentary, sub-commentary, elaborations of commentary, grand commentary, meta-commentary, textbooks about commentary, right? But the... the um, the whole edifice derives its authority from the fact that you've got an authoritative teacher at the, at the foundation of it. So you need to have a sutra foundation. So when the Mahayana arose, it needed a sutra foundation as well. Now we're going to move from Pali Sutta to Sanskrit Sutra because the Mahayana discourses of the Buddha are all written in Sanskrit and appear about 500 years after the death of the Buddha. And so there's a whole kind of authentication debate about those as well. So people who don't practice in the Mahayana tradition see all of them as kind of spurious texts, as frauds or fakes, um, in the way, say, that most Jews see the New Testament, right? Um, it's not part of the Bible. It's just a bunch of fraudulent stuff written yeah. you know, thousands of years afterwards, yeah, right? Okay. Um, so the... Uh, um, but for Mahayana practitioners, like for Christians in the New Testament, these are the most important, deepest, most profound teachings that only come along later when people are ready for them. And there's, you know, all kinds of nice fanciful stories about how these texts were actually taught during the time of the Buddha and then hidden for hundreds of years and then revealed and all of that. But we don't need to go into that. Yeah. In any case, there's a very large body of Mahayana Sutra literature, but the body to which Nagarjuna is, is immediately responding um, is a series of texts that are called the Prajnaparamita Sutras, or Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. And it's, that's a fairly uh, richly structured set of texts, um, the original of which is called the Ashtahashrika Prajnaparamita Sutra, or the Perfection of Wisdom Sutra in 8,000 verses. And then there's a bunch of expansions of that, and then contractions. And the one that listeners will probably know best is, is the contraction called the Heart of Wisdom Sutra, uh, which is a text that is roughly as popular in Asia as, say, the Lord's Prayer is in Christian um, communities, or the Shema is in Jewish communities. It's the text that everybody memorizes, because um, it's a nice memorizable short text. Um, but in any case, you've got the, the Sutra Foundation. And we know from monastic records and also from the diaries of Chinese pilgrims at this time that in the monasteries in India during this time, Mahayana and non-Mahayana practitioners were all in the same monasteries. And these weren't thought of as gigantic rivals, but rather as just different approaches to doing Buddhism or different, practice, different practices. I like to think of it as kind of like a nice eclectic philosophy department. Um, in the contemporary world where you've got some people who are reading, you know, only Anglo philosophy and some people are reading contemporary French and German philosophy. 
Um, and kind of unlike some departments, everybody still respects each other, but figures, <laughs> I don't really understand what you're doing. You don't really understand what I'm doing. That's cool. We're doing philosophy in different ways. Yeah. And, I, and I think that's roughly the way that, that the Mahayana um, and non-Mahayana practitioners were organized in, um, in India around about the period of Nagarjuna. Um, well, we also know there were rivalries for resources and things like that. You have to remember that in, just in terms of material culture, texts were extremely expensive during this period um, and because they had to be written by hand. Um, and they were also, they had to be constantly recopied because they were written in vegetable dyes on palm leaves. And in India, all kinds of insects and mildew and things like that want to eat up palm leaves. So any important text in your library, you've got to have a budget to recopy it quite regularly. And so we see competitions for resources and people petitioning for money to copy Mahayana texts. And people say, no, 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 don't waste money on those various texts, and things like that. So we kind of get some sense of the politics when, when we look at the material, cultural dimensions of all of this. It's kind of fun. Anyway, that's not what you want to hear about. Um, so, Round about, um, as I said, sometime in the late second century, plus or minus a hundred years, um, Nagarjuna emerges in um, in South India, and his status in Buddhism is uh, in Mahayana Buddhism is simply gigantic. Um, I say you can sort of think of him as, you know, Plato and Kant rolled into one. If you want to get a kind of sense of its right. importance wow. um, in this tradition. Um, like like the role and, that Aristotle yeah. has in um, Western logic, maybe where there's like no yes. one really, everyone well, just they, thinks he completes it or something. Um, yes, so, so something like that, right? Totally dominant. Yeah, like like that. So that when uh, Thomas Aquinas can talk about the philosopher, yeah, nobody asks which one, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so sometimes you see Nagarjuna referred to as the second Buddha or something like that in the. Mahayana tradition. But again, it's worth pointing out he's completely ignored in non-Mahayana traditions. Um, yeah. So that, that's we need to really bear this in mind. When we think, for instance, let me just back up for one moment for the benefit of listeners. As I said, the Mahayana is this big movement that gets going right about the turn of the millennium. It bifurcates soon after Nagarjuna into two major sub-philosophical traditions. There's the Madhyamaka tradition, which is the one that Nagarjuna initiates. And then about a hundred after his death, we get the beginning of a second Mahayana tradition called the Yogacara tradition, or sometimes called Chittamatra tradition, which is a highly idealistic or phenomenological Buddhist tradition. And there's a long period in India of um, interesting debate between Madhyamaka and Yogacara philosophers and some attempts at synthesis. And, but when we're trying to understand subsequent Buddhist philosophy in Central and East Asia, say in Tibet, or in China, Korea, or Japan, you want to think of it as conditioned by these two strands of medieval Buddhist philosophy in India, uh, Madhyamaka and Yogacara. But we're going to leave Yogacara aside for the purposes of this podcast. That's mm -hmm. time for another day. Yeah. It's its own <laughs> philosophical universe. Um, but in any case, Nagarjuna um, has written a number of very important treatises. By far the most important is Mula Majamaka Karika, the fundamental verses on the middle way, which is about 440 verses long, broken up by one of his commentators into 27 chapters. Um, then in addition to that, um, he's got a very nice kind of coda to that text called Vigraha Vyavartani, which we could translate as the reply to objections. So it's kind of like what Descartes wrote after a whole bunch of people wrote bad reviews of the meditations. <laughs> you can kind of see Madhyamakas and Namamsakas writing bad reviews of Mula Madhyamaka Karika, and the guardian responds to those in Vigraha Vyavartani. Um, then there's a little text called Yukta Shastika, 60 verses, um, that's a really nice text on uh, how to do reasoning, and then the Shunyata Saptati, the 70 verses on emptiness, which is an especially focused text on, on the notion of emptiness. Um, there's a couple of texts addressed to lay audiences. The most famous of those is a text on ethics and politics called Ratnavali, um, and there's another one called Sorlek, a letter to a friend. These are both addressed to a particular king um, who was patronizing Nagarjuna and his monastery 
and they're kind of fun, especially about Novelty, which has got a whole kind of grant proposal section in it as well, which is uh, kind of cool. You get a window into domestic politics uh, when, when you look at that. Um, and then there's various other stuff attributed to Nagarjuna that we don't need to worry about, some of it of dubious ad attribution. Um, Nagarjuna also inspires very large commentarial literature. And um, we, a lot of the way that we read Nagarjuna is through the commentaries of his authoritative commentators, people like Buddha Palata, Baba Veka, Chandra Kirti, Avalokitarata, um, and a kind of succession of commentators. Then Nagarjuna becomes very important in the Chan tradition in China, he becomes Zen in Japan, he becomes very important in Tibet as a founder of Madhyamaka, which becomes the most significant philosophical uh, movement in, in, in Tibet. So he's, he's really important. So, well, so am I right in thinking also that um, we get Zen Buddhism, which is the one that everybody knows about for, because it's uh, um, the one that's most in popular culture, is um, one that's spawned off from uh, Nagarjuna's work as well. Is that is that right? Can you trace a direct line from one to the other? Yeah, you, you can, and Nagarjuna is regarded as one of the Zen patriarchs. So Zen is the Japaneseification of Chan. Um, Chan is the sinification of the Sanskrit word jhana, which means meditation, right? So it means meditation Buddhism, which is why, and you can see why it's called that. But um, Chan itself weaves together strands from Madhyamaka and Yogacara, and also from some indigenous Chinese philosophy from the Taoist tradition hmm. um, to get the kind of uh, distinctive kind of Buddhism that we see in that we see in contemporary Zen, um, but the Guardian is very important there, and is widely cited um, in Zen literature, absolutely. Okay, good. So absolutely. I think I distracted you somewhat um, from that. So what we were, what I'd like to focus on then was that, so Nagarjuna comes along and he has, um, as you've outlined, a lot of, a lot of different uh, works, some ethical, some kind of metaphysical, um, and what we're going to focus on is this um, fundamental verses of the middle way. And as I understand it, and I'd like you to explain more carefully than I can, um, he comes along and proposes a kind of um, a more radical um, metaphysical understanding than what had gone beforehand, and in some way presents this kind of um, challenging uh, view about the nature of reality, which is uh, which I think is very interesting and leads to these um, paradoxical sounding and possibly just straightforwardly paradoxical um, statements about, about about the way that things are. So um, yeah, so so yeah. if you could explain what's going on in, in that text and um, with a light to, to those kind of issues, that would be wonderful. Sure. Sure. Now the first thing I want to say is we're talking about a text that's four hundred forty verses long and it spawned commentaries of thousands of pages. Mm. So I'm not going to explain everything that's going on in that no. text, and even <laughs> what I will explain, I'll explain at a very superficial level. Um, that's good. But fortunately, there's a big literature that listeners can turn to if they're interested by what I, by what I say. So that's the that's the big caveat. So the Guardian is reacting to this Abhidharma tradition that we've been talking about. The Chinese tradition, um, which proposes to identify conventional reality as fundamentally unreal mm. and ultimate reality as substantially real. Um, what Nagarjuna does is takes this doctrine of emptiness, right? The idea that things are empty of reality, um, that we see as the emptiness of conventional things in the, um, in the Abhidharma, and he universalizes it and pushes it to the end. So he says, when the Buddha's teaching that everything is empty, um, first of all, we have to ask what it's empty of. That is, I could say that my office right now is empty of elephants, it's even empty of my dogs, but it's not empty of people, I'm here, and it's not empty of books. And if you took the books and the people out, it wouldn't be completely empty, it would still have carpets and walls, right? So whenever you say empty, you have to ask empty of what? Mm -hmm. And Nagarjuna has argued that what the Buddha is saying when he's talking about Anatman is it's empty of having any intrinsic identity or any intrinsic reality or intrinsic nature. That nothing can withstand an analysis that's looking for its essence or its substantiality. 
Now, the Abhidharmic would have said, sure, for conventional phenomena, they're empty in that sense. But the evanescent dharmas that make them up, those things aren't empty. Those things are substantially real. The Garjana says, no, everything is empty of any substantiality or empty of any essence. Um, they're empty of any intrinsic reality because they're dependently originated, because they depend upon causation, because they depend upon wholes, because they depend upon parts, because even to be the kinds of dharmas they are, the kinds of momentary events they are, are, depends upon conceptual imputation in order to classify them. Um, so his argument was that emptiness goes all the way down. We never find a substantial ground um, for things. Any, no matter how far you analyze, you can um, you can always analyze further. And no matter what you come up with, the kind of existence that it has is always and can only be a relational existence not an intrinsic existence. So Nagarjuna argued that emptiness is universal. So one way of putting this is that Nagarjuna says, you know, if we want to diagnose primal confusion, going back to the Four Noble Truths, there's a reason that we started there, that primal confusion, Nagarjuna thought, was thinking that there is a fundamental nature of reality and then looking for it. And Nagarjuna's insight was there is no fundamental nature of reality. The idea of a fundamental nature is fundamentally screwed up, is incoherent. And so one way to see it is the ultimate reality of things, what you find at the end of analysis is that they are empty of having any ultimate reality. So we started out with a notion of two truths and two different levels of reality, conventional reality and ultimate reality. And in the Abhidharma, the idea was that the ultimate level was really, really real, and the conventional level wasn't real at all. Nagarjuna argues that that illicitly disparages the conventional and reifies the ultimate. Instead, he said, the ultimate reality of things simply is their absence of any intrinsic nature. And that is as dependent as anything else. So if I think about the absence of any intrinsic nature of my dog, that depends upon my dog. I can't say, you take my dog, I'll keep his absence of intrinsic nature. No dog, no absence of intrinsic nature of the dog. So the absence of intrinsic nature or emptiness is dependent upon things. So emptiness is dependent. So emptiness is empty. And this gives us Nagarjuna's really radical doctrine that emptiness is empty. The emptiness of emptiness is empty. And so all the way down. So where you might have thought that you had an illusory, real, illusory world and behind it you could find reality. Nagarjuna's insight is there is no behind. There is nothing deeper. There is no reality back there. So the ultimate name nature of things is to lack any ultimate nature. And that's the paradox, the priest and I call Nagarjuna's paradox, because emptiness is then the ultimate nature of things. And what it is, is the absence of any ultimate nature. <laughs> so the ultimate nature of things is to lack any ultimate nature. Moreover, Nagarjuna pointed out, we're tempted to the idea that things have intrinsic natures or intrinsic identities by our language, because language traffics in um, durable, persistent things, right? I mean, this is the point that Strawson made in the individuals. You can't even talk or think coherently if you don't presuppose physical, enduring, spatio-temporal things. Yeah. But as we've seen, Buddhism argues that there aren't any really any physical, enduring, spatio-temporal things. They're just all conventionally real. The Guardian agrees all conventionally real. That's not a way, though, of being unreal. That's the only way things get to be real. So, the idea is that emptiness, a world that doesn't have those things, is literally ineffable. But we've just described what it is. So we have a second paradox, which is a classic ineffability paradox, that emptiness has to be ineffable, which means we can't even say of it that it is ineffable, but we just have Mm -hmm. um, now, Nagarjuna endorses a lot of these paradoxes very explicitly. Um, one of his more famous ones is right at the very conclusion of his text. He says, I prostrate to Gautama, that's the Buddha, the best of all teachers, who taught the true doctrine that leads to the elimination of all views. 
all views, including the money on my computer, right? We even see Chandra Kirti's commentary on a wonderful verse in Mulla Chandra Karaka, this verse in the 12th chapter, Nagarjuna says, emptiness is taught for the relinquishing of all views, that is, all views about the fundamental nature of reality, right? Um, for anybody for whom to any for anybody for whom emptiness becomes a view, that person's completely incurable. Yeah. So he's arguing you shouldn't even have the idea that emptiness is giving you the nature of reality, because it's not. It's giving you the fact that reality doesn't have any nature, and that's its nature. Chandra Kirti, in his commentary on that verse, has a wonderful analogy. He says it's like this. Suppose you went into a shop. I like to imagine you're kind of in the old Eastern Europe before the fall of the Berlin Wall. You go into the shop and you say, I want to buy something. The shopkeeper says, I've got nothing on the shelves. And Chandra Kirti says, suppose you ask for two of those. What would you get? Right? So you have the nothing on the shelf. Well, two of the nothing, please. He said, That's what emptiness is like, right? And if you turn emptiness into an account of the nature of reality, you've turned it into the nothing that's on the shelves. Um, so we have to understand it's a pure negation. So what Nagarjuna is doing is sort of taking the Abhidharma analysis and then radicalizing it, pushing it all the way, and arguing that nothing has any intrinsic reality, and that that's the fundamental nature of reality. The fundamental nature of reality is there is no fundamental nature of reality. So what Nagarjuna does is he distinguishes the two truths, the truths of tables and chairs and me and you, from the truth, ultimate truth of emptiness, and then argues that since what emptiness is, is dependent origination, that the two truths are also identical. And the way Tsongkhapa, a great um, 14th, 15th century Tibetan commentator on Nagarjuna puts it, is that the two truths, conventional and ultimate, are extensionally identical and intentionally distinct. That they're the same entity, but understood through two different conceptual um, understandings. One is to understand things through looking for a fundamental nature of reality and not seeing it. And the other is looking at things through the fact, the conventional fact, of dependent origination and finding them as dependently originated. That's the Madhyamaka metaphysics that Nagarjuna generates. Mm, okay, great. And that's like, um, I'm sure lots of people listening to this are going to find that incredibly difficult to get their heads around because it, it, it just is, right? It's just a very... Um, it's kind of an enchanting idea, but it's also um, difficult to fit into one's kind of conceptual scheme. Right? We're so used to making the distinction between the way things appear and the way things really are. Right? It's there in Plato. It's there yes. in Kant. It's there in uh, it's there in this contemporary kind of scientific understanding of the world. Right? And it's all over the Indian tradition, including early Buddhism, and that's what Nagarjuna is criticizing. Yes. Saying, stop thinking. If you just roll up the curtain, you'll find something realer. Everything that's real is right here, and the only reality you can even imagine is conventional reality. Okay, good. So does that mean? Okay, so I'm 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 wondering how to kind of uh, what the consequences of that view are. And on the one hand, um, I see there being a kind of worry, right? Um, and I'll, I'll try and spell that out, but I got the feeling that what you're going to do is tell me that it gets dissolved, and I, I got a feeling of what the resolution is to this worry as well. So let me try and see if I'm on the right track with this. Right. So on the one hand, it feels like there's going to be a worry here, where what you're doing is saying, look, there's nothing underneath the curtain, right? There's no deeper reality. There's no substance behind the appearances, um, and but then that seems to usher in this idea of, well, you know, nothing really matters then, right? If I'm um, if I punched you in the face or something, you know, there's nothing really there anyway, like there's no real depth to anything, there's nothing really, there's there's no consequence really, there's no real meaning to anything. Something like this, it kind of seems to usher in a kind of nihilism, right? Yeah. And I feel like what you're going to yeah. do, apart from telling me that I've forgotten all the other moral teachings that went along um, before this, um, is, is to dissolve it in this way, right? Which is to say something like, um, well... The, the point that you arrive at when you understand that there's nothing behind the appearances it is exactly the point you were at when you started off the investigation in the first place, right? You haven't lost anything that you had originally, right? Your, um, the, enlighten, the enlightenment that you get from this understanding, if, I, if I'm getting it right, is that um, 
is that feeling enlightened is feeling exactly the same as you felt before you started wondering what enlightenment was, something like that. Like it's a completely mundane, normal, everyday life just is as deep as it goes, right? So there's no, um, that's why it, 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 you're not taking anything away, right? There wasn't any deeper, more substantial reason, any meaning or anything there in the first place, right? We're not really bringing, ushering in nihilism. We're just sort of coming back to the normal mundane reasons for not punching someone in the face or whatever it is being... Uh, being in play as they were in the first place. Is, is that right? Am I on the right track with that kind of uh, thought here? Yeah. But, but let me say that you've got heads, and I'm going to give you tails now, kind of the other side of that coin, yeah. which I think is equally important. Um, and this isn't to, dis- to, to detract at all from what you said, but it's to give it a slightly different dimension. There is something that you've lost, and what you've lost is the sense that there has to be something deeper for all of this to make any sense. Mm. And so one way to look at Arjuna's is disparagement. And by the way, you see this running all the way through the Zen tradition. And we can sort of talk about that in terms of Zen in a minute if you want. But um, one way to look at this is that if you really thought that in order for it to be morally wrong for you to punch me in the face, there had to be something supernatural lying behind it that made it morally wrong, then you really don't think there's anything very bad about punching me in the face. You think there's something bad about violating a supernatural value. Mm. Um, and that's this kind of fallacy of, you know, of look, thinking that enchantment requires the depth, right? Yeah. And what Nagarjuna is doing is saying, no, um, there's nothing supernatural. All the value you ever wanted is right here in the convention world Mm. you don't have to look somewhere else to figure out why it's wrong to punch me in the face you have to look at the way that our world works and why that's a really bad thing to do on its own terms yes um think for instance about the one thought too many problem that bernard williams uh raised years ago right so you're in the hospital and i come to visit you and you say it's so nice that you came to visit me and I say yeah I just realized it's all an obligation to visit friends so I came (laughs) Um, the one thought too many is looking for the depths right looking for something transcendent that made it important for me to visit you rather than you and the guardian is trying to bring you back to the conventional world where you live and asking you don't disparage the only values you've got by thinking that there has to be something more important than those. Yeah. So I want to not just thinking, oh, there's just really nothing so deep. It's that there is depth, only the depth is on the surface. Um, it's right here in the conventional world. And I think that's that's an extraordinarily important insight. So when, you know, in the Zen tradition, we have that wonderful aphorism, before I studied Zen, mountains were mountains and water was water. And then after I studied Zen, mountains just ceased being mountains and water ceased being water. But now that I've studied Zen for a long time, mountains are just mountains and water is just water. Yeah, right. So you cut the importance of the conventional as containing all you need it. You don't need to go behind it. Um, okay, good. So I think is the origin is deepest insights. So now it makes me want to. Um, so. I, what I want to do to be first, firstly, is I need to pour myself another drink because we're getting to that point where it's getting quite deep, and uh, I think a small whiskey will help me get Go. crack on. Yeah, um, it's good. Pour a large one. <laughs> now we're talking um, in these terms. Uh, it's making me think that um, what Nagarjuna is up to is similar to what the later Wittgenstein is up to in some respects, right? So. Um, there's some kind of therapeutic element to this, right? There's, it's a kind of resolution to philosophical worries about metaphysics in particular. Um, so later Wittgenstein wants to say, I mean, there's lots of different ways of characterizing what he's up to, of course, right? But the way I think of it is that he's saying something like, well, there are different ways of talking in particular about the mind and things about belief and pain and blah, blah, blah. And we get stuck into... Um, taking those ways of speaking too seriously or something and and those when we kind of uh, reify those uh, entities and things we we get stuck in in little um things that don't quite seem to work together properly little problems philosophical problems but then they don't really have any resolution because like the concepts themselves just just don't really fit together properly there's always like little spaces that you can't resolve 
and his way of coming uh, coming to those problems isn't to uh, think of some even more nuanced um, metaphysical theory that fills in that little bit of gap, but just to try and remind people of commonplace everyday facts about the way that they use words as a way to um, but sort of snap them out of it or something. Like, um, you should, you know, don't take this too seriously, right? As if uh, these ways of speaking really had deep metaphysical significance to them. And once you realise that they don't, then that's a way of showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle, right? So he's saying something like, the aim of philosophy is um, to get to the point where you can stop doing philosophy, right? Because you're not worried about these questions anymore. And I see, am I right in picking up that there's some element of that going on in Nagarjuna's thought here as well, right? This kind of, he's, he's not trying to come up with another metaphysical theory that's along the same lines, but to try and say something like, look, there's, this whole enterprise is um, is going nowhere, right? There isn't really any metaphysical theories to be had about anything. Is that does that seem right to you? That does, and of course, there's a large industry of Nagarjuna and Wittgenstein comparison. Is that um, like because of that? Yeah, yeah. The Wittgenstein and Buddhism industry is is huge, and indeed, in my translation of Willamma Jamaka Karaka, I advert to Wittgenstein quite a bit. Uh -huh. um, if you take a look at my book, Engaging Buddhism, I draw that parallel as well. Chris Goodmanson, his wonderful book, Wittgenstein and Buddhism, did that. Um, but no, there's, there's an industry there. Um, I think if you think about the investigations, think about paragraph 308, that's the one about inner mechanisms, mm -hmm. um, where Wittgenstein says, oh, we, we understand what thought is. We understand it on the notion that the mind it's a mechanism right that only unlike an external mechanism it's an inner mechanism yeah. and it works just like a machine only inside and then you try to push the analogy and the whole thing falls to pieces right exactly. and the guardian is kind of the guardian is doing the same thing he's arguing you know we try to think about conventional reality as having some fundamental nature we kind of know what we mean by understanding the nature of something and then we sort of suppose well you know, I know what an apple's like. It's sweet and it's hard and it's crispy. So the world must have a way that it's like. And so you just do that extrapolation. And it's so intuitive and so stupid, right? <laughs> um, and so, yes, what he's doing is arguing that this whole enterprise of trying to figure out the fundamental nature of reality is not one that has to be done better. It's one that shouldn't be done. Right, okay, so good. You're off on a confusion. So then, in that case... Um I, I feel like I want to put him in a bracket of philosophers um, that includes Wittgenstein, but also I think I like to put the early Socrates in this pile as well, um, and possibly Nietzsche and maybe Derrida as a kind of... Definitely Nietzsche and Hume. as well, right. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, possibly. Well, so my way of thinking is that these are um, primarily destructive philosophers, right? They're coming along trying to... Um, deflate uh, philosophical pretensions rather than rather than someone like Leibniz or Kant or David Lewis or someone who's like proposing a grand sort of scheme of things. They're they're coming along trying to take schemes to pieces and show that that whole process of put putting things together and building systems is is wrong. Right. So he's a he's a mischief making uh, destructive philosopher. Does that does that feel right as well? Yeah, I wouldn't use <coughs> quite that language. I would say that the people we've pointed to are all Pironian philosophers. Hmm. Um, that is, they're all philosophers um, who attempt to show that so much of what passes for metaphysics or epistemology or ethics is an attempt to ground our human conventions in something non-conventional. Mm. And that instead, what we need to see is that conventions, as Wittgenstein put it, are where the spade is turned. Mm. Um, there's the wonderful metaphor in uncertainty. We looked for the foundations of the house and found that they were held up by the walls. Mm. Um, a, a, and that's really what, what Nagarjuna is doing. He's um, engaged in a kind of Peronian quest, and that's what really the thread that holds certain parts of Socratic uh, thinking um, together with Pyrrho, with Sextus and Pyrrhicus, with Bale, with Hume, with Nietzsche, with Wittgenstein. And there's just a very nice you know, link through, the, through them, and the link is uh, the Peronian tradition. Okay, good. So I had this other thought, which was that um, 
well, and I mean, I'm not sure how, how well this works, right? But I'm struck by an analogy, and this might seem odd, but I'm struck by an analogy between Nagarjuna and Karnap in one sense, where it's like this, um, they both feel like they're philosophers who are saying something about metaphysics, which is that there's really nothing to say about metaphysics, right? So it's a kind of um, logical positivism as well in here somehow, that everything is conventional or something. Right, and, and that led me, brought me to something that I was tempted to say, but decided it would take us into too much history of 20th century philosophy <laughs> a few minutes ago. Because Carnap is getting those ideas from Wittgenstein as well, but from the Tractatus. Yeah. So when you talked about later Wittgenstein, what I was about to say was later and earlier, um, depending on which strands you see as preserved from the Tractatus into the investigations. Yeah, sure. And one of them is the anti-metaphysical strand um, and the skeptical strand. And so, yes, you're right to uh, point to Carnap um, as weirdly in that tradition as well. Mm. Okay, good. And, of course, you're right to also Derrida, but um, I would say also Sellers and Heidegger. Mm, yeah, okay, good. So in, in many ways, he's um, an obscure um, figure to those in the Western tradition who's who has no direct influences with Western philosophy, he wasn't influenced by any Aristotle or um, anyone um, in that field, and and I take it didn't, didn't really feed into the Western kind of... Um, well, there, there are several lines of thought here, and the book to which I would direct your listeners is a, well, there's a couple, but the, the best one is one by Tom Machiavelli, the art historian called The Shape of Ancient Thought. But since then, there's been a book by Beckwith called The, um, the Greek, Greek Buddha. And then there's also um, one by Kuczynski called Skepticism and Buddhism. Anyway, there's a long history here of people looking at the fact that we know that Pyrrho and Timon traveled with Alexander to India, whereas Diogenes Laertius tells us they debated with the gymnosophists, and they came back saying various things. And almost all of the quotations that Diogenes Laertius ascribes to Timon and to Pyrrho are either direct quotes or paraphrases from the Perfection of Wisdom Sutras. Um, now, I don't want to point causal arrows in any direction here, and, and Machiavelli carefully doesn't either. Machiavelli points out, though, that the Persian court, um, during most of the end of the, the, the millennium before the Common Era and the first 500 years of the Common Era, was a busy meeting place for intellectuals and traders from the Mediterranean and India. And so that there was a constant intercourse of ideas and goods um, between, between India and the Mediterranean. But the kingdom of Bactria uh, was a Greek kingdom, right? There's this wonderful um, illustration that always takes my breath away in Machiavelli's book, which is of a coin struck in the first millennium um, of the first century of the Common Era in Bactria, which was then Menander. Um, and it's a, a beautiful um, Greco Roman kind of head, and underneath it is the legend in Greek letters, Beta, Epsilon, Delta, Delta, Alpha. Um, so you've got coins being struck with Greek names, with the Buddha being mm. the, the head on the coin. Mm. So we know that there's Greco-Indian uh, interaction. What we don't know is who's in influencing who, when, and how. But mm. it would be crazy to think that the ancient world was hermetically built in, out of hermetically sealed philosophical communities. Sure, yeah. It would also be crazy to think that we know that that influence. Yeah, okay. Um, although, having said that, it uh, there's no direct references. Um, the, I mean, so if we take... That's right. So Nagarjuna is... Um, so he's 150 to 250 uh, AD, right? Those, those are his dates. Somewhere in the area, yeah. Roughly the time of Sextus Empiricus. Yeah. Think about that. Um, and it's not a great period f soon after that for Western, Western European civilization, right? The Roman Empire collapses a couple of hundred years after that, and then um, nobody's really worrying that too much, too much about 
um, intellectual things, it seems, although that's a bit of a simplification, but um, we don't have that's, anyone... That's a big... <laughs> You're forgetting about everything that's happening in the Islamic world. Um, yes, you're thinking, um, forget right. about Avaro and Avicenna, right? And, well, and, don't they pick up around sort of so 600 ish, something along along that lines, right? Yeah. yeah. And do they, so are there yeah. any, I mean, does Avicenna or Averroes or um, any of those guys, do they reference um, Buddhist thinkers? I mean, does Nagarjuna seep his way no, into that? No, nobody in Europe ever references India, um, except Diogenes Laertius mm. when he points out that. Piero and Timon went there. That's it. Okay. That's it. Nor does any India reference Greece. On the other hand, we've got all these kind of tantalizing bits of evidence of, of communication, but it's all tiny tantalizing shreds that you don't want to make too much of, but you also don't want to make too little of. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good. So there's another element to this which we haven't really dwelt on yet, which I think would be interesting for you to say a, a bit more about, which is the idea that... Um, so there's one, while we've drawn all these parallels between thinkers in the Western tradition and, um, and Nagarjuna and the, the Indian traditions in general, um, there's one very big difference which we don't see in the Western traditions, right? And which you and Graham in this paper were keen to, to bring out and embrace, right? Which is the idea that um, Nagarjuna is committing the kind of heresy of Western philosophy, which is to uh, entertain the, the idea of a contradiction, right? This... Um, there's something right. you, you traced at least, is it two or was it three um, kind of con contradictions or paradoxes that are going on in um, in Nagarjuna's thought? Um, and, and maybe want to I say something Arjuna's a little bit more about how that fits in and the, the idea of dialetheism and, and there being uh, contradictions. Sure. One way to think about this um, is that at Nagar in Nagarjuna's time and before that, Buddhist logicians always partitioned logical space into four corners, as they call them, chattis koti. And of course, anybody who knows the Meyer Dunn semantics for relevance logic immediately thinks of the kind of uh, the, the lattices with the four corners that give us the semantics of first degree entailment. And that's just too weird to think about. Um, anyway, the, um, but the Buddhists always thought that with respect to logical space, truth and falsity is sort independently so that you could have sentences that are just true that are just false that are both true and false or that are neither true nor false and that that's how you want to think about logical space little footnote i mean the james has a seven way partic <laughs> uh, partition of logical space so many valuational logics were not unknown to indian thinkers mm. um you might ask yourself what so odd about post-Aristotelian logic that people focused for so long, really until the early 20th century, um, on a logical space that only had two uh, possible valuations. So, you know, if you've got two truth values, um, as Nagarjuna thought you did, the James thought you had three, which is how they get up to seven. So it's three, uh, it's two to the cubed, and they thought you, you throw away the empty set. So. Um, that, that's where that's coming from. But so when you think about both the Arjuna or the Buddhists and the Jains, figured you start out with a set of truth values and then you draw subsets of those to evaluate sentences. You don't draw members of those. Aristotle figured you draw members. Mm. That's a really, that's just a difference in choices. The moment you think you're drawing subsets, then you think that there's a lot of different ways to evaluate sentences. Um, and what that means is, that doesn't mean you think that all contradictions are true any more than you think that all sentences are true, but you think that logical space um, retains the possibility that some sentences will be both true and false, um, like the idea that things have no fundamental nature. Um, but then some sentences may have no truth value either. The Buddha thought, you know, the unanswerable questions, for instance, are just that true values. Um, and one way to think about that again is to go back to that notion of truth as something in which you can trust. Um, you might be able to trust both answers depending on, on, on how you're looking at it. You might not be able to trust any answer because you've got insufficient information. And a really cool thing, if you read um, Noel Belknap's great paper on four-valued logics for computers, hmm. when he talks, says these truth values have to be understood as told true, told <laughs> false, told both, 
told neither, right? That is what you can rely on. Um, and that's really how the Buddhist logicians were thinking about these. The Jains were developing a discussive logic. So they thought that in any conversation, a sentence could either have the truth value true, false, or be completely indeterminate. That mm. is, you don't really have any reason for believing or disbelieving it. But then they thought that in a conversation, different participants might assign it true, false, or indeterminate, so that you had to have all possible combinations of those three I see. In, in order to get your logical going. So all I want to say is people think, oh, gee, Indian logic, really weird. They entertain contradictions. I want to say Western logic, really weird. Nobody ever <laughs> came up with the idea that you could assign subsets of sets of truth values as valuations um, instead of members. And one way to think about that is that Western logicians were mesmerized by Aristotle's definition of truth um, as being you know, saying of that which is that it is and that which it is not that it's not. Mm. And so thinking of truth in terms of correspondence. And then, the, and that's a mystification, right? Because if you start thinking about truth as correspondence, you'd better tell me what that correspondence relation looks like. And nobody's been able to figure that sucker out. Whereas the Indians thought of truth as measuring the degree of confidence, the degree of trust you could place in something, right? Um, is it Their gloss is deceptive versus non-deceptive. Things can be both deceptive and non-deceptive or things might not be in the business of deceiving or non-deceiving. And so they thought of subsets as quite natural. Now that idea comes back to the West only when we get to the work of the Polish logicians in the early part of the 20th century. It's Jan Łukasiewicz mm. who, um, in his many valued logics, resuscitates the idea of not drawing members but drawing subsets in your set of truth values for valuations. Um, so we come to it late, but just because we came to it 2,000 years later, that's not a reason to think that what they did was weird. I like to think of it as logically prescient. Well, yeah, okay, but so that's true. Uh, <laughs> and so that's me you take religion seriously. Yeah. Right, right, I mean, yeah, so you could say which wants to say that there's a third truth value or indeed a range or something. Um, but even he's not going to go as far as to say that there's both two truth values for the same proposition. Um, and I think for many people, it just strikes them as as um, as not making as being something they can't understand how it could be true. Right? That, that's the problem. I think for some people. He does in the four. He does in the four valued logic when he crosses, not in the three-valued, but in the four-valued logic, is a cross of classical logic with itself, right? So what you get are the four truth values come out as true, 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 false, false, true, and neither, right? Mm. Um, and then, and of course, he flattens them. But um, notice that that comes from a Cartesian cross of classical logic with itself. Um, so, no, Lukashevich was thinking interestingly. Mm. Uh, now, he might have been deep in, deep in the schlitter bits when he thought that, but what he <laughs> had was exactly the right idea, um, that logical space can be partitioned in different ways. Um, why do we think that contradictions are bad? We think that contradictions are bad because most post-Aristotelian logics validate explosion. That is, they have reference from A and not A to B, right? Yeah. So that you can do it, you derive anything from a contradiction. Um, no Indian lost that inference. As long as you don't validate that inference, there's nothing really bad about country. It does sentences that have two truth values. Yeah. Um, now, most of us, I would say, since Tarski, have recognized that if we speak any language at all, We've got to be able to talk about truth. And if we can talk about truth, we're immediately committed to contradictions. Um, we've had to get used to that. All I want to say is that Indian Buddhist philosophers were used to that a very, very long time ago. Um, what we've had to do is to weaken our consequence relation in order to make sense of that. But that's exactly the weak consequence relation that Indian logicians always embraced and for much the same reason. Mm. Um, and so I just consider that much more sophisticated logic mm. than came out in the West for the next 2,000 years.
so basically you're just you just have a much more laid back attitude towards the idea of uh, there being contradictions it's just like yeah that's it's not such a big deal right it's weird to have a kind of to worry about them being there in the first place anyway right that's that's more like your view of it. right well i think it's weird i don't think true contradictions are weird i think explosion is weird yeah um anybody tells me that because they believe the the liar sent which is both true and false that it follows that I'm a grilled cheese sandwich. I have, <laughs> I've got real problems with that person's reasoning. Yeah. Um, but I've got no problem with saying the best way to handle the liar is to say that it's both true and false. Or the best way to say that there's a fundamental nature of reality is to say that that's true and false. Yeah, so, I mean, all right. So, but in particular, what's going on is that we're not suggesting that there are um, true contradictions around every corner, right? That um, it might just be tomorrow that it's both sunny and not sunny in the same place at the same time or something, or that um, this whiskey is going to both be whiskey and vodka at the same time, right? Um, th th those types of things are not like, mundane, normal, everyday things uh, that aren't threatened in particular, not just because explosion's not valid, but because... Um, the embrace of the contradiction is somehow relegated to being of a particular type of thing, right? It's things at the periphery of uh, what we can think about, what we can speak about. It, it, does, that, is that, does that feel right to you, that we, we were willing to entertain contradictions but only at the limits of our cognition or something? That's, that's where they arise. And notice that that's what Nagar is worrying them about. Yeah. But Nagar certainly thinks that conventional reality is boringly consistent. Um, but ultimate reality is kind of a limit to analysis, right? Um, and that's where contradictions appear. Mm. So in one sense, you don't find contradictions every time you walk into the garden. On the other, in another sense, they're absolutely every place because the deep nature of everything is contradictory. That's the Gargenist idea, right? That the fundamental nature of everything is contradictory, but the conventional nature of everything is perfectly consistent. Mm. Yes, okay. Here's a way to put that point in Tarskian terms, if you want. Mm -hmm. um, the greenness of grass isn't contradictory. The whiteness of snow isn't contradictory. But that it's true that snow is white, and that it's true that grass is green, is absolutely contradictory. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think at this point we may have melted the brains of lots of listeners <laughs> in a good way. Um, so at this point, let's, let's, let's bring this to a close, although it's been um, incredibly enjoyable. I'm sure we could keep talking for a lot longer, um, but it's, it's getting later here. Um, so thanks very much for coming on. I hope it's been all right. Thank you very much for having me.